Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Michelle Sacker, Chief Operating Officer at Fold & Company. Welcome to our webinar, Driving Market Success with Innovation, which we are co-hosting with Catapult Insights. Today, we are going to explore how our panelists drive innovation within their organizations. We'll talk about how to overcome barriers to cultivate an innovation mindset. We'll also discuss their approaches for gener generating groundbreaking ideas and what they see as the keys to success. To discuss these topics and innovation more widely, I'm delighted to be joined by innovation experts, Justin Sutton, Dr. Tiffany Carl, and Colin Byard. Let me introduce them to you. Justin has built and led innovation practices at numerous international research suppliers, and he has trained many client organizations in forming their own internal innovation practices. He is now the co-founder of Catapult Insights, a full service business and research consulting firm where his work focuses on building an empathetic understanding of how people function and make decisions, uncovering unmet needs, and supporting clients' innovation efforts to build award-winning solutions across a variety of industries. Tiffany serves as principal scientist on Mary Kay's upstream research team. With nearly two decades of experience in new product development, she holds over 200 global patents. In her role as a biochemist, Dr. Carl delves into skin biology, discovering innovative technologies that enhance skin care. She also leads a cross-functional team focused on generating insights and ideas to fuel the R&D innovation pipeline. Colin is an innovation catalyst at Delta Fawcett Company, specializing in uncovering consumer needs to inspire innovation. With expertise in design thinking, market research, and strategy, Colin works to ensure that product and service innovations delight end consumers while also making sense for the business. Prior to joining Delta Fawcett Company, Colin worked at the University Innovation Alliance, where he leveraged the same skill set to generate, incubate, and scale policy and program innovations to close the achievement gap between majority and minority students at large public research universities. Welcome to our esteemed panelists. And for our audience, if you have any questions during our discussion, please enter them in the questions box at the side of your screen, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the segment. Thank you for being here and let's get started. So I'm gonna start with the first topic, which is driving innovation. So Justin, if I could start with you, where does innovation come from? Sure, uh, so I really think that innovation can come from anywhere, but I can share some observations from my experiences. Um, I think there are a lot of skill sets and conditions that uh, make innovation successful, but two that I often come back to are creativity and empathy. Now, creativity is the more obvious one, uh, having the right people in the right environment where creative thought is encouraged and exercised regularly. It's, it's kind of like a muscle that can grow or atrophy based on, um, you know, how often you use it and what you feed it, right? Um, the second is empathy. Um, and this is really a, a skill that puts all of that creative ability on target. Um, it's the ability to have a, a need state called out and defined for you, even though it may not be something that you personally struggle with, and then being able to hone your creative thought on solution development. It's fantastic when the person who experiences the need is also the creator, the creator of the solution, but it doesn't always have to be that way. So when you find the right people and put them in the right environment and give them a focal point, you can really get powerful results. Great. Uh, Colin, would you like to weigh in? What is innovation? Yeah. Where does it come from? Definitely. There's so many ways to think about this, right? And I think that, that to Justin's point, I, I agree with him on the empathy. I think there's probably too many sources of inspiration and that's actually part of the problem. I think a really key input to this is to be really honest about who you are as an organization and align that to those consumer needs because I, there's so many things you could solve. So at Delta Fossil Company, we make products in the kitchen and bath. There are so many different places and spaces where consumers are interacting with our products they're not all equally as valuable to solve. And so for us, we've put a lot of effort over the last few years into not only saying, here's what's valuable to the end user in those spaces, 
but here's the relative importance to them. And here are the things that they're willing to pay to have solved better. And here are the things that they aren't. And that's been a huge driver of helping us cut and cull through the mass amount of inspiration that can exist and to play within a sandbox where you can actually deploy that creativity, meaning innovation, people just want to say it's everything, just be creative, no holds barred. But actually constraints are immensely helpful at being able to actually enact change and to focus in an area that's actually meaningful. And so for me, I agree with Justin, the consumer need, and I want to make sure that, that you're also taking the time to appropriately size and balance all of the needs you could be solving against each other to solve for the most valuable ones. Otherwise, I, I feel like you might waste your time chasing your tail around all of the variety of things you could be solving for, because in a lot of these spaces, there's just so many. So take the time to size them and make sure that you're sizing them based on what's meaningful to that end user first, and then what's meaningful to the business next. Really interesting. Um, Tiffany, how about you? Where does innovation come from at Mary Kay? It comes from all kinds of sources. Um, you know, it really kind of depends on the project and the need, but we've had colleagues that were in the Jamba Juice and saw a acai on the recipe board and was like, hey, what's that for skincare? Um, we go outside of our immediate uh, industry. So another colleague that was at an academic conference that was looking at sports physiology and learned about muscle contraction. We're like, hey, how does that impact wrinkles on the face? And maybe we can think about something there. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, people in a room with stickies. It happens when you're out in your life and you kind of, um, whether you're looking for it or not, um, you can be inspired by all kinds of things and have to be creative in ways to apply it to your job and to what is good for your business. Well, that's really interesting. So you're highlighting some maybe more unconventional sources of inspiration for innovation. Uh, anybody else would like to weigh in on maybe some sort of not typical um, or more unconventional sources of inspiration for innovation? Um, Colin, how about you? What are, are the typical sources that you might use uh, for your innovation pipeline? Yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of a lot of spaces that you can go to and that you can use. And I, I love what what Tiffany had to, to share about using kind of parallel thinking. Uh, I'm a believer that creativity is really an inherent human trait and it's really the in, intersecting two things that you didn't know were related together. And so we put a lot of effort into putting people in spaces and places where they're able to experience these kinds of, of parallel convergence paths. So we recently uh, did an innovation session where we focused a lot on what rituals people are practicing in their life. Like what are you personally feel emotionally connected to and what are little things that you do on a regular basis that are giving you uh, a certain mental state uh, and kind of driving that forward. And how can we connect that back to, to our products? And we got some really interesting parallel paths where people talked about, you know, different kind of religious experiences that they practice and how that might relate to some experiences they're having in the bathroom on a more grand level, but even on a more like uh, kind of simple level, little ways that we prepare ourselves for the work day. How does that relate? And how can we use that as inspiration to think differently about how our products show up in people's lives in their bathroom? And it was really productive to think through it that way. And so I, I, I just want to reemphasize Tiffany's point on that parallel processing path, because there's so many opportunities to connect things that we might not uh, kind of naturally consider connected. So that's interesting. So Tiffany talked about some adjacent industries and also looking outside of kind of industry in general, going to, to academia. And you talked about really getting down and talking and understanding people's experiences in their daily lives. Justin, are there other sources, either conventional or unconventional, that you'd like to talk about? I mean, I think a lot of our audience might be familiar with just general consumer insights research and other things. Is there anything else you'd like to highlight here? Sure. Uh, yeah, we had a really cool project about uh, wellness. That was the topic and um, what role that certain natural elements like water can play in achieving personal goals within that realm. Uh, and we we started that process um, with a number of what we call team building experiences, you know, to key in on, on what Colin was talking about, really um, centering people in shared experiences leading up to an ideation session where Essentially, what we did was identify various ways that consumers were using those natural elements today. And we sent our teams 
to those places to experience it for themselves. So we had teams going to aquatic uh, PT and rehab centers um, to, to get into mm. those pools and have experiences for themselves. Others going to a spa for a you know, new age spa treatments. It's a pretty rough day on a project when you have to go to the spa, I know, but <laughs> we, we did it and they, they, they grinned and bared it. Uh, and we had others going and having other experiences as a source of inspiration for that idea generation. Um, and these teams then came back together for a series of creativity exercises interspersed with storytelling about those adventures that they went on. Um, and then what we also did was sprinkled in a few uh, highly creative consumers uh, into the mix in that ideation session just to bring in even more outside perspective and catalyst. Uh, and the results really surprised us all at how much new ground those ideas spanned. Okay, very interesting. And do sign me up the next time you're going to be doing that kind of primary research. Yeah, top um, of the list. Just a, a quick follow-up question to, to me, to Colin, and to Tiffany. So we talked about primary research and really sort of seeing the, the consumers and, and their behaviors. And um, Tiffany, you talked about learning from other industries. Are there any kind of secondary sources that you've ever leveraged uh, for innovation ideas? That you'd like to share, Colin? You see, I see you're nodding. Do you want to weigh in on that? I think. Yeah, I can. I can jump in real quick. Um, one of the we're releasing a, a new product later this year, and, and there's some. I don't want to call them well-established competitors because they're brands you've never heard of. They're kind of direct sourced from from overseas kind of solutions, and we knew that that their solution wasn't as robust as it as it could be. Um, and so what we did is we actually ran um, an analysis with with you all at Fold on reviews. Uh, of those products online to try and find both places where, like, what are consumers saying they really like about this product that we can make sure that we're including? But more importantly, what are some of the places where mm, maybe they're less satisfied with how this product's currently performing for them? And we use those as some key design criteria in order to create what I think and believe, and I think we'll eventually show, is a superior offering in a, in a similar space. And I think that's a, an exciting way to use some of that secondary uh, opportunities and, and components to, to build out because we had done a lot of the primary research to know like this is a real problem that consumers are experiencing in their home and we thought we had an idea to solve it and then we used that work to validate and then add a couple of tweaks to make sure that we were we were going in the right direction there so uh, I think that's a good secondary research opportunity because it's out there if you can go grab it um, especially if it's something that's on market already or, or is uh, a close enough parallel consumers are using it to solve similar problems. I think you can glean some information from that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that example in because I think people do forget that there's a lot of information that's out there that it's publicly available um, that they don't actually have to engage primary in primary actually just leveraging user reviews, what people are actually saying. That's their, their gut feel, they're volunteering that information. Um, it's basically observed behavior, right? Because they're actually reacting to a, a, an item that they bought. Um, Tiffany, I'll just throw it over to you. Is there anything you want to mention there in terms of leveraging secondary information? We use a lot of uh, trend houses to kind of really, these sub, just subscription services that kind of feed you a daily feed of what is happening in the marketplace from competitors, from uh, small brands, big brands. We look into fashion, food and beverage, and we have a lot of these uh, insights that kind of come to us. And we use that to kind of get a pulse of what is happening out there. Are we seeing similar things across you know, different industries? And it's a hard thing to do. Um, but it's helpful when you have kind of these different feeds that can come into you. Some of them are paid, but some of them, you know, to Colin's point, it's just out there. You just have to take the time to, to go and find it and to figure out what is the question that you're really asking. Um, you know, I think that was something that he mentioned earlier. When you're thinking big, 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 once you put guardrails into what you're looking for, it's a lot easier to source what you're trying to find. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm actually going to stay with you, Tiffany, here for a minute. And I, we've been talking a lot about the innovation pipeline and new product development, but there are other types of innovation. Uh, what about commercial innovation? Have you ever um, thought to basically reignite uh, uh, an item's life cycle out there in the, mar in the marketplace um, and their lifespan by just sort of reinvigorating a product's messaging? Yes, this is so important because it takes a lot of time to launch a new product. But when we have products out there that we know our consumers love, 
what else can we say about them? And this is sometimes when we get the, um, you can see the trends out there of, you know, all of a sudden people are really thinking about neck care, the decollete, the uh, um, what are we doing and how is, you know, are looking at our phones all the time affecting the care of our neck. So we can do a study with a product we already have on the market. Hey, how about we run a clinical and see how our product does help the neck area. And now all of a sudden you reinvigorate an existing product for a new emerging problem. Um, we've done that a lot with our other products. For example, blue light all of a sudden became a huge issue when we first launched one of our lines. That was not a thing. But as we see it in the market, now we can test our product again and say, wow, now we protect against blue light, which is you know, one of the kind of things that we like to infuse new life into uh, existing products. Because again, it's a lot harder to get a whole new product out there versus commercially advertise better for something that you already have. And as we're all sitting here in front of our video screens all day, actually, I need to find out about some of those products that help protect us against blue light. Um, Colin, I think you, you might um, have some examples possibly on, on the commercial innovation side as well. Yeah, I think one, one of my strongest beliefs is we spend a lot of time talking about product features and benefits and what's the right kind of product assortment. And I probably spend uh, you know, five hours for every 12 seconds that we then think about what does it mean to actually commercialize that and how do we ensure that we are making the benefits as obvious to the consumer as they are to us. I often think that, that we can think pretty insulary about our products. We're experts in it. We think about faucets and fixtures all the time, every day of our lives. My wife is always the, the grand balancing act in my life where uh, I'll be like, here's a, I'm so excited about this. And she's like, you need to chill. You need to calm down. Like people do not care about this in the same way that, that you do. It's a good reminder to me uh, that, that we need to pay attention to and, and be respectful of how consumers view our category. And so sometimes we release innovative products and, it's, and we make, might not make the benefit as obvious to consumers as it should be. Um, and one example is we released a really innovative coating for a lot of our faucets and fixtures that make them incredibly spot resistant. To the point of like we do demonstrations with customers in our building where you can like write on them with sharpie and just wipe it off with your finger it's like super interesting really really resistant from from scratching and from you know watermarks and things like that and when we released it to market it wasn't performing as we expected and so we had to really dive deep and understand like we know we have a winning product from a feature standpoint here are we not talking about it correctly and so we were able to refine some of that messaging. So differently than where Tiffany's trying to find new uses, sometimes you might have the right product and it's actually not, you're just not messaging it and marketing it and making the benefits as obvious to consumers as you could. And I think being agile and being willing to invest just as much in understanding how you're talking about your innovation as you are building the product features for your innovation is a huge component of being successful and not just creating a product, but serving an offering that actually delivers the value you hope it delivers to consumers. That's a great example. And we're going to get to sort of the organization and structure and, and an innovation mindset in a minute. Um, and, and we can pick up on that. But just, I just want to turn to you to see if you have any examples you want to talk about in this area sure. of commercial innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what I'm hearing uh, Tiffany and Colin both talking about is, you know, innovation isn't always product centric, right? We're not always trying to make a new product. Sometimes it's a new experience or a service. Uh, it could be you're, you're renaming or rebranding something or just talking about something that already exists in a new way. And there's the, a lot of creativity that goes into something like that. And um, just to keep things brief here, uh, many years ago, um, we were working with um, Energizer um, and batteries are not a new product. But at the time, they had come out with uh, lithium batteries, which really opened the door to many new use cases for batteries that didn't previously exist with the, the older uh, battery technologies. Um, so we helped them uh, create various messaging platforms upon which their creative agency could then build different messages. But we, we worked again with creative consumers at the time uh, to, to basically look at different ways of talking about something that everyone already knows a lot about, but now suddenly has this new capability that we we were unsure at the time how are we going to message this to the everyday person in a way that they would really grasp immediately and and understand at the time you know why why does this battery cost a little bit more than the other what does that really get me 
That's a terrific example. Um, I also just want to remind our audience to please uh, submit questions. I did see a really excellent question come in. I will get to it. I just want to dive first into the next topic area, which is around organization and structure. And so I think, Justin, you know, I'll, I'll pick up with you. You were just chatting. Um, talk a little bit about how innovation is structured within, well, not necessarily within your respective organizations, but you've worked with a number of different client organizations. Are, do you see that innovation, that innovation is centered in a dedicated team, or is it oftentimes integrated across various departments? And talk a little bit about kind of the cyclicality of innovation. Sure, and I, you know, I'll, I'll give the worst kind of answer is it, it, it depends, but you're right. Being on the supplier side, I've had that good fortune of seeing how many organizations approach innovation. Um, so just to, you know, to give you an example, you, know, you mentioned cyclicality. Um, I've worked with automotive clients who basically generate ideas once every few years, and then they work on that pipeline for the next five years. Um, and then they, they don't really do a whole lot of active continuous ideation. Whereas I have other clients I've worked with who are building more of a continuous culture around innovation. Um, neither way is right or wrong way of doing it. It's just different ways of doing it. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the less commonly you engage in idea generation, the more you will probably benefit from bringing in some outside perspectives and creative skills from uh, others beyond your organization. Um, and on the other side of that coin, the more continuous you and your organization are in practicing innovation, I think the more challenging it can be to manage the pool of ideas being generated. And Colin made the point earlier, you know, if you're always innovating, you're going to build up a lot of ideas. But then also, how do you how do you know what challenges, what consumer challenges to focus on? So that's that's kind of one of the, the, the tricky um, areas for for those who are more continually practicing innovation. But in both cases, regardless of frequency, I found it is incredibly beneficial to involve a cross functional team from the onset. And, Having everyone learning and building together creates a synergy uh, and should, in theory, make it easier for good and timely ideas to then make it to market. Excellent uh, examples and best practices. Um, let's talk specifically about a couple organizations. Tiffany, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about Mary Kay and uh, what does it look like there? Are you, are, do you have a dedicated group? Are you cross-functional teams? How does it work? Right. Well, uh, I'm part of R&D, so R&D by definition is going to be doing research. Um, but we have found, you know, the day to day takes priority. Um, when you have deadlines, you have calendar dates, uh, innovation kind of takes a back seat. So we really have developed a cross functional team, which was great for from people that are not on any of these calendar projects from people who are in the marketing side that are in the experience side that are in um, the um, the product side and the R&D to kind of work together and so we kind of have a different team that focuses a lot of our time there um, but it is it is challenging I think um, when I've been looking at other organizations to Justin's point, um, I've seen a lot of other companies that have, this is your dedicated team and you do five years up and the rest of us are working on the day to day, uh, but that's hard to do. You have to really have the bigger organization with the resources to do it. And so at Mary Kay, we've tried different things. Um, everybody does a little bit, but uh, what I think is working best is when you actually have a team that is dedicated to it. And that's what we've been building for the last five years or so. Oh, that's great. Uh, Colin, what about at Delta Fawcett? Is it a dedicated team? How does it work in the organization? Yeah, I'm going to zoom back a little bit. I'm going to give people, if, if there's one resource that you read, there's this amazing article. Uh, the author's name is O'Reilly 2019 California Business Review Journal. He talks about the difference. I, we use the word innovation, and it's this like circus tent giant thing that encompasses things from like uh, uh, moderate product improvements to like industry changing technological leaps. And, and those things get managed differently. And O'Reilly really digs into this and talks about the difference between incremental and discontinuous innovation. And at Delta Fossil Company, we, we kind of have organized ourselves around that a little bit. And we use similar processes across 
different parts of the organization in order to crosswalk what's happening and people understand where, where things are at procedurally in terms of concepts and ideas. But incremental innovation, like moderate product improvements for us, is really managed by, by the day-to-day -day business team. They're mo monitoring the competitive set. They have really amazing intel into what's being released by our traditional competitors and maybe some new competitors. And they are the smartest people in the world at managing that part of the business and they deploy similar tools and similar process uh, kind of guidance to, to develop improvements to, to that core offering. But then we also have kind of like an advanced innovation and research team that's focusing on more discontinuous innovation, things that the core business might not be ready to, to absorb. Because oftentimes, if you're being truly disruptive, you're either expanding into new categories, requiring different distribution channels, requiring different technologies that you're not comfortable working with as an organization. And those are just a couple small examples of things that you would need to manage differently. Instead of trying to just plan, design, and then go and build, you need to generate different solution sets to these things. You need to incubate them to prove out that they're, they're viable business uh, opportunities and that they're technically feasible to build at scale. And then you can actually scale them from that point and so, for example, our, our kind of advanced research team is working on this amazing technological leap, you know, opportunity. And, and, and the discussion is we generate it. We think we have the right solution. How do we incubate it? Right. And so now there's lots of ongoing discussions about how can we kind of prove out the business viability of this? Do we do a, you know, kind of off branded or unbranded small batch selling program? Do we do these kinds of innovative market testing things to prove out that this idea has more merit? Because it can't just go through the traditional process because it's different enough that we don't understand it ourselves well enough yet from a go to market perspective to be able to execute against it. And so I really think that from an organizational standpoint, you have to think about what are your strengths and what are you trying to accomplish? Do you want to be truly incremental and exploit what your business is good at today? Or do you want to participate in some of this discontinuous innovation that's maybe a little bit more disruptive and particularly if it's disruptive i think you have to sequester it from the core business operations where it'll just never get worked on uh, because all of these incremental things that have shorter term measurable roi are always going to take priority over these disruptive things that quite honestly are going are uncomfortable because they might ask core business stakeholders to do their jobs differently and why would you work on that instead of these other things i totally get that and so at, at delta foster company we, we have figured out a way use similar processes, similar tools and techniques, but anchor who's working on them based on kind of where they fall on that spectrum. Got it. And, and I'm going to actually uh, ask you to follow, uh, to follow up with you on that because you're actually bringing in entirely different topics around um, disruptive innovation. So not just necessarily an innovative product, but sort of the typical kind of funnel and pipeline of new product, uh, new product development and new innovative products, but almost disruptive products that with different distribution channels and ideas and ways to communicate to the clients. So whether it's with the incremental um, sort of new product ideas or really disruptive ideas, what do you, what kind of approach do you follow? And you talked about having some sort of regular processes. Can you talk a little bit more about those processes that you have in place and what approach do you take within the organization to see some of these new ideas through? Yeah, I'm gonna uh, pull, pull Justin's answer, it depends. I think that that's one of the hardest <laughs> things about innovation in general is that the answer is almost always it depends. And your organization and, and kind of the culture you're building around your ability to manage ambiguity, I think is an enormous piece here. And so some of the depends. Do we need to build out low resolution or what I like to call no resolution prototypes of a thing and get them in front of consumers instantaneously, immediately, just like low and qualitative feedback? We just did this recently. Someone had a super disruptive showering idea. And so they built it out of paper cups and cardboard paper and Sharpies. And we, I brought in six to seven consumers just to get their initial take on what experiencing this is going to ask people to interact differently with their shower than they do today. And I always get nervous around asking people to disrupt their routine. And so they were able to build this thing out of, again, like literal, just like arts and crafts in order to get some real insight to consumer value. That might be something you need to do. You might be ready to do a very complex choice-based analysis on uh, a product feature benefit set in order to discover willingness to pay 
and kind of uh, optimize different feature combinations. That you might be ready to do something like that. But along the stage for, for us, a thing is not ready to enter the traditional product development process until we've proven out that this is a consumer's desire, this solution, that this is going to be an economically viable path for the business to take in terms of both top line revenue and that it's going to have enough profit margin in order to be the value add to the business. And then we have to know if we can build it or source it feasibly, right? Innovations at the sweet spot of that consumer desirability, business viability, and technical feasibility. And our processes are designed regardless of if it's discontinuous or incremental to get to the point where you've answered those three questions before we're willing to take it into the core business and work through the traditional scaling product development process. Great. So uh, I, uh, I, you've brought up a lot of ideas there, and I actually want to get back to this uh, question of how do you manage risk, because we had actually a question come in about that. We're going to um, ask that in a minute. I just want to, before we move on to that topic of, of best, practices, best practices managing risk and keys to success, Justin, I just wanted to ask you, because Colin brought up this interesting uh, idea of uh, presenting ideas to potential consumers in a different way, and I know you work with a lot of leading edge uh, consumers and you do some interesting sort of ethnographic work. Can you talk a little bit about any other approaches that we haven't uh, chatted about in terms of um, thinking about how to drive innovation? Sure. Uh, I, I mean, you know, backing up to the, the top of the order, the question about, you know, different approaches for innovation, you know, I, I'd say there's a million ways you can approach it. You know, we've done everything from you know, back in the COVID days, we were doing, you know, purely online ideation sessions with clients, just their internal folks. We've done similar with consumers and all the way down to the other end of the spectrum where we're spending, you know, a week in an Airbnb living together with clients and consumers and, and really generating ideas. But I would say that, um, you know, I guess where we would consider innovation and research to be fairly distinct practices within our organization, and we handle them fairly differently. And, you know, one is right brain and one is left brain. Um, so while we don't typically mix them directly, we can see them working closely together. So for instance, before we even dive into solution development and ideation, we found it really incredibly useful to spend time fully understanding the human needs that exist um, through various research methods like ethnographies or, you know, in situ approaches. Um, and then from there, we would then define and distill those needs into focused statements. Um, and what we end up with are platforms for the ideation um, uh, efforts that really focus uh, and they, they have focus and purpose. Um, so we know what the problem is, who experiences it, uh, what that feels like for them in that moment and how they react when there are either insufficient or imperfect solutions that, that they're left with. Um, and then transferring that level of insight into whoever it is that is responsible for ideation is imperative to creating what I would say would be meaningful solutions. Got it. Okay. So actually now I really, so you, you brought us to the point where we're saying like, where can we find these meaningful solutions? And I, I want to come back again to this question of how to be successful in driving innovation through. And I, we talked a little bit earlier, um, there were some ideas that came up. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tiffany. Can you talk a little bit about best practices, what you have seen works best within your organization in being able to drive ideas through? I think the number one thing is you have to have a um, you got to have early buy in. You got to have leaders who believe in innovation and you have to have all the teams that it's going to impact to be on board from the start to know these are different things that are happening. We're looking at things a different way so that they're informed that this is something that we're looking at. We're, in, we're interested. So when the time comes, when they have to put money and time and resources behind it, they are not blindsided like, what is this? I never heard of this. Why do I want this? But they've learned from the start. Yeah, I, I feel yeah, I think that's interesting. And then it might be six months later, like, oh, yeah, I remember we heard about that. And then when it finally gets to a, an absolute project, this is the team of people that know what's going on and they've already been engaged and uh, already understand what and why we're going to do what we're interested in. 
So uh, early buy-in, I think, is very, very important. And secondarily, you have to have a very cross-functional team. It can't be just the R&D scientists that are really into this. It can't be just the marketing team that thinks we need this. You really need to have that collaboration across these divisions. Um, and so that is, I think, those are the two most important aspects to really pushing new ideas through. Yeah, so planting those seeds early um, with the wide variety of people across a number of different departments and cultivating that uh, various times throughout the process. Um, terrific. I just want to, uh, before we move on, Colin or Justin, do you have anything you'd like to weigh in on that? Or Colin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's essential to, to bring people along on the journey. I, I often view innovation as like the world's longest relay race. And I think that in like an ideal like business process world, like you, everyone agrees, like we're kind of autonomous, autonomous, we like agree that like this is our, our decision place and we're going to pass you the baton here. But it's, it's interesting that, that narratives and stories get built about ideas as they get built out through the organization and different levels of information are communicated at different times to different people and different layers, especially Mary Kay's a large organization, Delta Fawcett Company is a large organization. Lots of people don't have great insight into what's happening. And so sometimes I think it feels like you, you're just handing the baton off to the business stakeholder and being like, congratulations, you, it's your turn. You have to run four laps and like, I, I, like here you go. And they don't know that you just ran 16 laps to get them to the point in the journey where they only have to run four. And so I, I just think it's really critical to bring people along on the journey in, in, in the process. Because, you know, it's, it's funny how many times I, that we, we end up having these, these funny discussions where we almost get to the point where we're like redoing work that research or work we've already done uh, because someone else who wasn't a part of it is asking the same kinds of questions, which are great questions. Or maybe they're slightly more specific versions of questions we've already tackled. And so it's a good opportunity to reflect and go, hold on, like, does this answer your question or not? Like, or do we need to do additional work here or, or not? And so we've just found a, a lot of success at bringing those core stakeholders along on the journey with us. And that looks different from project to project and people's capacity to be able to come along on that journey with us. I'm not going to pretend like me asking someone to come with me on a research trip is a small ask in that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, have them prioritize this over running the core business so that I can do the innovation stuff and they're collecting, you know, the resources so we can do that. But at the same time, it's so important for people to be there just from a change management perspective. And, and there's nothing quite like seeing it live and in person. You know, I'm a firm believer that there's just something qualitatively different about your stakeholder being in the room with you as the consumers are reacting, as things are being made. You know, I can put quotes on a slide. It's not the same as someone seeing the person say it and seeing them struggle with whatever problem that you're trying to, to overcome. And that's been a huge opportunity for us is to ensure that all of the people who need to make these key decisions are included in the process along the way. Who doesn't want their fingerprints touching something? It's so much easier if everyone understands what the full relay race is instead of just focusing on the laps that they have to run. Thank you. And I, I, that's a I, I hear a lot of similarities in terms of best practices and bringing everyone along and gaining alignment and seeing things live in person. I just want to turn to you, Justin, really quickly, just to make sure you don't have anything to add before we move on. It's, it's hard to add much, uh, Tiffany and Colin, <laughs> plus one to everything that you said. Um, the, the one thing I will add is that I often see a drop in project momentum right here at it, like once ideas are generated and then it's like okay where do we go like what does the rest of that runway look like um, so it's it's not a unique issue lots of organizations struggle with that and the thing that we have um, found helps combat that is part of the part of your project from the get-go you need to know that there's going to be an action plan that should be developed at that point where specific people, specific departments are assigned to champion various parts of what happens next. And again, that can look a million different ways depending on the organization, right? But um, knowing that an action plan is needed at that moment to help combat that drop, that dip in momentum um, is, is very helpful. Great, great. I'm actually gonna stick with you because I wanna talk a little bit about managing the risks associated with innovation. So you talked a little bit, it sounded like you were kind of, there was a little bit of element of de-risking the process um, with the involvement, but how in general people, I, we have a question also coming in that I'll get to in a minute. What, how do you de-risk 
that investment. There's there's money associated with investment in in all of these different research projects that you discussed. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, de-risking. I, I think whether it's in the context of innovation or just any sort of move that you know in business that's being made today, de-risking is is a big topic. Um, and risk is inherent in innovation, but there are ways to what I would say mitigate it. Um, you know, harnessing natural creative talents, whether those are internal or external to your organization and focusing efforts on real needs that people are, uh, are experiencing are paramount. Yeah, and I've said that already, but so is starting things with a purpose and, uh, you know, keying in on some things that um, I think both Colin and Tiffany have mentioned, you know, at the beginning of, of an initiative, ask yourself, what does success look like at the end of this project? Are we aiming for incremental innovation or is so is it more we're aiming for something that's going to be first of its kind um what are the boundaries for us as a brand where are we unwilling or unable to play either because it's beyond our capability or because it's just not staying true to who we are as a brand uh, asking these types of questions is not a stifling of the creativity that will follow it's a step to keep perspective on the direction of the overall project. You can take the reins off during the actual ideation step, but having a North Star in mind from the start will really help you prevent wasted resources down the road. You're muted, Michelle. Apologies. Uh, I, I was going to ask uh, Colin or Tiffany, would you like to weigh in? Um, how do you de-risk innovation? Do you have, from your own organizational perspectives, uh, what do you see? Is that something that can be done? I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that um, the idea of de-risking innovation is actually a, a, a mind trap that we end up in because it assumes that there's a point where we've reached a minimal amount of risk. I think true innovation is always inherently risky. I think it's always going to carry that. I think one of those ways to embrace, I like mitigate, but I'm going to say embrace the risk that is, you know, there's this awesome book, sec second resource of, uh, of the, the webinar. Uh, there's a book called Idea Flow by um, Jeremy Utley and Perry Claibon, and they really dig deep into this idea of portfolio management, where one of the key things is to ensure that you have a broad enough portfolio and you're running regular experiments against that portfolio to allow things to drop out and, and agreeing on the front end that you that things will drop out and that you cannot actually bring all of the innovations to market and understanding how much your organization can absorb I think is a really key component to this and so we we cast an enormous funnel at the top end I manage a, a concept database where we've tested this in the exact same way with consumers concepts over the last 12 years, we have almost 1,700 things in this database. And I'm trying to cull the 1,700 to like, let's call it 150. I'm making up a number. There's not an exact number. But what's a more manageable number for key business stakeholders to then evaluate and take into some of these processes that we discussed earlier to actually, again, move it through the innovation pipeline and prove out the, the business viability of it. And that's just one way. But again, I'm not eliminating. We're just creating a filter mechanism and a, and a mechanism for people to be able to say, I'm willing to take on this amount of risk, knowing that consumers find these kinds of value propositions more desirable than these kind of value propositions. And as you move it on, then there's a new portfolio of things that you have to balance and evaluate against each other and continue to move those along. And hopefully by the end, you know, the, the experts say it takes, you know, 4,000 ideas to generate like 225 concepts to do 12 to 15 in market experiments to find two or three successes. That's a huge funnel that you have to drive through at the end. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about risk management or risk em embracing that kind of risk is you're going to kill things. And you need to agree ahead of time that you're going to kill things. And I think a really healthy culture and Google X, I think is a really great example of this. If ever, anyone wants to look into the culture they built around celebrating project kills, I think is a really interesting way to do this where you're not just you're not dejected or disappointed from killing you're, you're celebrated because you're making what's actually a very brave business decision to say we're going to invest our resources here instead of here and that's hard because people pour their hearts and souls into these 
into these ideas, into these concepts, into these innovations, and saying we're no longer going to work on that because there's more fruitful territory over here is very brave. And that's a difficult thing to do from a like management perspective, but is essential, I think, to ensuring that your risk is appropriately accounted for. I view it a little bit like investing, right? You, you want to, if you want to have the big gains, you're going to take on a lot of risk accordingly. You just have to accept that, that sometimes your portfolio might, might lose, you know, a very large percent of the value along the way. And so what's your risk tolerance? How are you managing that similar to an investment por portfolio? I think is a key way to, to think about this. That's an interesting approach. And actually, it's a perfect segue to the question that we had from our audience, which is, how do you cap the effort and budget in innovation so that if you fail, you fail fast? I don't know if there's anybody, if there are specific uh, processes or guardrails or examples that you have. Um, I'll take the first stab at this. Yeah, go ahead. Because I think it's a tough question. Uh, my, my stab at this is, I see my role in the organization is how do we drive as much cost out of innovation as possible. And so I use design thinking as my core methodology. And one of the key components of that is like no resolution or low resolution prototype testing. So we've started to get in the habit of as early as possible, creating ideas for like, again, the, whatever the cost of cardboard, scissors, glue sticks, and people's time are, and seeing what proves valuable out of that. And then maybe we'll do 3D printed models and we'll test it again with consumers. But again, in this like really low resolution, really cheap way to ensure that only the best concepts and, and things that are truly delightful to consumers are moving through the process to the next stage, to the next stage, to the next stage. And how can we avoid doing very expensive, robust research for things that we don't even know well enough yet to do that kind of research on? And so how can we drive as much cost out of the earliest stages as possible? So that way we can invest that money when we know something has proven out enough value that we can move it forward. And so I've, I've made it my personal mission, whether people know this in, at Delta or not, is how can I do early stage innovation as cheap and as fast as possible so we can invest those dollars elsewhere down the line or optimize the amount of tests we're able to do and really you know, shorten those, those learning loops accordingly. So I think that's one way to, to cap costs is to really understand and be comfortable with doing lighter touch work when you need to and understanding when to bring in the more robust and expensive approaches, right? Like working with Justin, I love working with Justin. It's not cheap to work with Justin. And so how can I make sure that we're bringing Justin and his skill set and expertise in on projects at the right time and at the right moment? So he, we're optimizing that kind of resource expenditure from our business side uh, at the right moments, on the right projects, at the right time, instead of just relying on that as our only answer. Perfect. And Tiffany, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I don't, you work in skincare, so I don't think, you know, arts and crafts and glue sticks and paper and scissors are going to work for you. What, what, how do you address this issue of capping, you know, the effort and the budget and in, in innovation? So if you fail, you fail uh, fast. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of jealous. I love to go to Michael's and build some stuff out and, and figure out how to work, but you're right. It doesn't work in skincare. It just, it's not the same kind of animal. Uh, we have a team that has this brilliant, brilliant asset uh, using um, consumer data. So, we have a platform where there's a whole broad a group of consumers and they've opted into this and they get a survey on their phone and they can get two questions, three questions. So we can kind of get a quick pulse within a day of what do 300 people think of this? Um, we can do the same thing in the US, we can do it in China, we have different markets, but can with the mobility and how people love to opt in, they're able to get quick survey results, that is an amazing platform that you know would have taken months, you know, ten years ago. But now you can really use electronic resources to get a really quick pulse of what do people think. So we can put an image out there, an idea. Uh, that's kind of our first gate, I think. And then from there we kind of build it out. But um, that is a great resource, I think, that is relatively inexpensive uh, solution just to kind of get that initial thought on do we yes or no. And it's a good, it's a great resource that I love. My, my partners can use it in a day. It is, it is really a cool thing that we can do now digitally. Terrific example. Justin, do you have anything you wanted to weigh in on here? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Um, so 
innovation teams deal with ambiguity. It's just a way of life, right? Um, and organizations have different tolerances for timing and the resources and everything that goes into bringing ideas to the masses. And I can share a couple of different examples with you. Uh, so going back 15 years ago, I was working with a QSR client, a quick serve restaurant client, um, to understand the dinner occasion. Um, so we did some uh, research. We started with research uh, to define what dinner means to everyday folks, uh, what made it unique and special and enjoyable. Uh, and then we identified some of their pain points. And one of those was how might we uh, help busy people more easily provide dinner for their families? It wasn't a new problem 15 years ago, and it's not a completely solved problem even today. Uh, but we tasked ourselves with developing what that could mean in the context of this client's business at that time. Um, so what, what we then did is we conducted ideation sessions with our community of trained creative thinkers, just as we still do today, uh, and generated dozens of concepts. The essence of several of those concepts went on to become the Chick-fil-A mobile app and later the backbone of their drive-through ordering experiences. But it took years of work and testing to get there. Um, but their motto at the time as an organization was to aim three times so that they would always hit their mark. And that diligence really paid off for them as an organization. Alternatively, a, a retail giant that I, I work with today uses what they call bias for action as one of their leadership principles. And what this means is they are comfortable with moving very fast and learning from the challenges that they face as they iterate. It's, it's like you're building the plane as you're flying it. Um, and I, I lived that firsthand on a study about a new checkout technology to help with the checkout experiences at a, a retail store. And we went from field work to report to iterating the, the solution and then back to field testing version 2.0 in less than a month. And that's a sprint if I've ever seen one. Amazing example and um, just goes to show how important innovation is, even if you don't have the results specifically on, on the initial topic that you were thinking of addressing on. Um, it's important to just keep that mindset um, throughout the organization and keeping people motivated even when their initial ideas don't come to fruition. We do have a couple questions here. So I um, I think the topic of motivation is one we could probably cover, take another entire webinar on. So let me just answer some of the questions that are coming in from our audience. So we have a question. Um, what role, if any, does your CFO or finance business partner play in supporting you in accessing the funds and other resources required to support your innovation efforts? Does anybody want to take that one? Uh, I'll take a stab. Um, it goes through our leadership. I, I have no idea because the uh, <laughs> chief innovation officer um, at our organization, she runs the show. And so we give her, we, it's not something that I visibly see from my level. I'm sure as you go up the chain, it's definitely um, an issue, but I'll say from working in the trenches in R&D, I don't see it. So uh, that's definitely a, a, a culture that she is fostered. And so, um, you know, that is kind of a C-suite question. And I think one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning is to have innovation, you have to have leadership that is, um, they have to support it. And if you don't have that there, then it's just not gonna happen long-term. Great. Um, uh, getting the um, leadership involved, very, very important. Colin, did you wanna answer that also? As yeah, I'll just have one one small piece. I, I think it's a um, it's an unspoken contract between between finance and, and innovation, and and I think that finance plays a really critical role in holding innovation accountable to not just delivering interesting new cool things, but ensuring that there is a business return on it. Um, and so, for example, our our finance VP recently challenged our our product development team and said, "Hey, like." You know, we've been investing in this space and, and what I'm seeing is, is we're getting close to the kind of, of returns that we're hoping, but we might not be quite there yet. What can we push on in order to make that happen? Uh, and I love that kind of partnership. And it's not just always a like support, support, support. I think finance plays a key challenge role to challenge the innovation unit to make tough decisions. Because if not, I think I've seen innovation units at, at other organizations that I have, you know, 
friends work at, at a different conference event, they can, you can kind of spin for forever. Um, and I think finance plays a, a, a really good compass role for the innovation team to say, when push comes to shove, are we meeting the financial objectives of the organization and of our shareholders? And if the answer is no, then we need to start maybe making some different decisions. So I think, yes, like the, the support and the investment, but I also really like the challenge that that can provide as well and the constraint and thought that it can provide to say, you know what, like I want to do X, but maybe doing Y is more valuable right now in order to prove out the value of X. And so those kind of constraints are helpful in innovation, not harmful. And so I like the support and the challenge that that finance partnership can provide. That's terrific. And I, I just want to say that these questions that we're getting from the audience are really, really terrific. We're coming really short to the, you were coming really close to the end of our webinar. So we're not going to be able to answer all of them in the context of this session. So before we close, um, quickly, if I can ask all of you to share some last words of wisdom, what advice would you give to our audience on driving innovation through their own organizations and any pitfalls they should avoid? Tiffany, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I think the number one thing is to don't go it alone. Um, you, whether innovation is part of your job description or not, if it's something you're passionate about, then you can, and you're able to show value, you can put this into your job. And the best way to do that is don't do it alone. Find the coalition of the interested in your organization, whether this is in their job description or not. If it's not, the more they do it, they can show value and eventually it can be, it has happened um, in our organization. So don't go it alone because number one, it's really, really hard. And number two, it is not any fun. Um, so make sure you're investing wisely with, with your resources and, and use your resources Perfect. and the people around you. Excellent, excellent words of advice. Um, we're Colin, you quickly and then afterwards, Justin. Yeah, uh, I think you need to be not the role your organization needs. Like, I think you've got to think way outside of what your role is necessarily designed to do to drive success. I think that you have to be a good system thinker in order to enable innovation more, more broadly. And I think you get invited into interesting spaces across the organization as a result of the unique skill set you bring from working on innovation. I've gotten asked to lead a whole bunch of interesting, weird workshops that are completely unrelated to product innovation because of that value that I add. But then that adds value to me because I get to learn how our organization is working systemically and how we can put different points of pressure on different places in the marketplace, in the organization uh, accordingly. And so I often try to think not what my role needs, but what do I need to be for the business to be successful? And Amazing. I think that that's like a really interesting entrepreneur innovation mindset to take into your organization is like, hey, like figure out how you can go beyond what your role is asked to do in order to drive value uh, throughout the innovation cycle. And so that's my advice to people is think way beyond what your role was assigned to do, because if you're assigned to do innovation, I think you're actually assigned to do way more than that for the organization. I think you're meant to be that, that energy and that focus on thinking and behaving and acting differently as an organization and take that kind of uh, opportunity to drive beyond what maybe you're comfortable doing. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm going to, Justin, I'm going to give you the last word, but I also want to let everybody know that we will get a, an, an email out to everybody with the recording to this webinar so you can watch it afterwards. And please do feel free to follow up with questions. We'll also let you um, give you our contact information. Justin, please close it out with your words of advice to our audience. Sure. Well, Colin, the, the better you are, the more you get pulled into. It's a double-edged sword, but you're, you're living it right now. Uh, but back to the, the question at hand, um, I would say great ideas evolve continuously, starting from the moment they're born. Um, so unless you're an organization of one, expect to see your ideas reformed and built upon by your colleagues and resist the urge to be overly protective. And instead, you know, encourage your idea to grow and, and grow wings and go places you never expected. If, if you love your idea, set it free. Perfect. Thank you so much. So this is my quick wrap up. Uh, thank you so much to our uh, to Justin, to Tiffany, and to Colin for sharing some of your brilliant insights on innovation. We certainly need to have a follow up. Um, and thank you to our attendees for joining us. Again, we'll send you the link to the replay, and we're happy to answer questions that didn't get answered today. 
Thanks to everybody and goodbye for now. Thanks everyone. Thanks.